Sa Kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat, what a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo, oh, yeah. You know, we ain't just talking about another branch on the family tree. We're talking about a different tree. Uh, we're talking about trees. Thought we're talking about animals. Uh, animal trees. Just sing the song, mate. A bit faster this time. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Oh, yeah. We're made different. For example, have you ever heard a camel try and sing? No, but birds can sing. Fair point. Very repetitive lyrics, though. <laughs> Let's try it faster. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala, rubber tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Oh yeah. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. All right, now you got your blood flowing, you're ready to hear some uh, Bible teaching, how about that? Um, it is uh, wonderful to have you guys here, uh, we're so grateful that you've chosen to, to gather here to worship with us, uh, we pray that, um, you know, even in things like that, kind of getting back to simple things, uh, the way we teach children, uh, I do promise that those songs will kind of bore themselves in your head and uh, you'll find them, uh, you know, sticking there for a while. Uh, but that's the beautiful thing about, you know, kind of doing things simple sometimes is kind of reconnecting to how we teach the basics of the faith, that God made us uh, and desires relationship with us. Our sin separates us from him, and he provides a way in Jesus Christ. So it's a great thing to just remind uh, not only the kids, but ourselves every year of kind of stopping and, and doing that. So it's a, it's a tremendous blessing. I hope that uh, you're blessed by that. Um, hopefully you, uh, as you come in, we're, we're glad that you're here. Uh, hopefully you got a bulletin. If not, um, <clears throat> a couple things going on. Like I said, we have the VBS going through, uh, uh, you know, the rest of this month. Um, but we'll, you know, have our, our normal service, service times. Uh, and then we're uh, working through this series on the confession. I'll talk about that in a second. And then I, I noticed, like, uh, as I was preparing the bulletin this week, September 11th, which, you know, September 11th, but uh, we begin our Revelation series on that day. And so I was like, oh man, we're like a month out. So I was like, whoa, <laughs> I need to get preparing for that. Um, but anyway, so we have that coming up. Very much looking forward to that. Uh, is, um, and then our small groups will start back up in September. Uh, we'll connect you with all that information. Uh, we've got some, uh, like a survey that we're going to send out fairly soon, uh, kind of 
kind of getting to know what are your uh, desires in that, when can you meet, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, be looking for that. Uh, we have a member meeting that's coming up next Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, so it'll be here. We'll have child care provided, uh, and so we would love to, to have you come for that. Uh, we were going to do something quick, um, but uh, so we have some like membership approval things that we need to do. Uh, but there's also just been a lot of questions that have come up as we've uh, discussed the uh, you know, confession. And so I thought it'd be appropriate for us to have a time where we can chat about some things. Uh, so that'll be also uh, in that time next week. Our unreached country of the week is Niger, uh, which is in kind of central western Africa. And I uh, want to be praying for them. So let's go to the Lord to, to pray together and then we'll get into his word. Holy God, you are absolutely sovereign over all creatures uh, to act through them, for them, and upon them as you please. Just wonderful things that we just sang about, um, that you have created a beautiful world, and yet distinctively you have made us. In your sight, Father, everything is open and visible. Your knowledge is infinite and infallible. It doesn't depend on any creature, for, uh, so for you, nothing is contingent or uncertain. You are absolutely holy in all your plans, in all your works, and in all your commands. Every single creature, angels, human beings, owe to you all the worship, service, or obedience that creatures owe to the Creator. Father God, we pray for those who have started school this week. God, we ask for your blessings to be upon the students, teachers, faculty, and administration. We ask for your providential work in their lives as they learn and make relational investments all for your glory. God, we thank you for the ability to learn, period. So whether we are learning at church or school or jobs or anywhere, we thank you that we can think and reason so that we might know you. Lord, we pray that you will help your people to be the beacons of light that we need to be in dark places. God, we ask you that you bring blessing to all the churches in our area as we are gathering this morning to bring glory to you. God, we ask that a clear gospel is preached in each and every one. We pray for your spirit's work in the hearts of the people who hear it. God, please send revival to our neighborhoods. Let people repent of their sins and come to faith in Christ so that many will know you and that your name will be magnified, that the very fabric of our communities can be changed. God, we do pray for Niger and the work that is done there. We pray that you will um, be working in the midst of the cultural and spiritual strongholds that are there. Uh, Father, we know that there is a strong terrorist president, particularly against Westerners, and so that makes perhaps uh, more outside um, faithful ministry more difficult. So God, we just pray that you will help overcome that, primarily, God, by the gospel raising up within that culture, um, that they will have uh, trained pastors and leaders, uh, even if they have to leave for a while and then come back, Lord, um, that uh, you will really plant a seed of the, the faith there. God, we pray for these first and second generation churches that will rise up there. Um, Lord, we ask that they will be healthy churches, trusting in you and your word and your spirit uh, to bring them the health. We know that in Africa, there is a, a lot of um, really just false gospels going around. And so we pray that, um, that you will do a great work there of bringing the one true gospel. And so whether it's sending more workers there, Lord, or allowing people um, to, uh, to be trained somewhere else and then to go back, we ask for faithful workers who will um, trust in you. Lord, we ask that you will incline our ears and our hearts to receive your message this morning, and we pray all of these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, so we are continuing on in our series as uh, over the summer we've been looking at the uh, 1689 London Baptist Confession. We've been looking at a modernized uh, version of it to just try to challenge ourselves to get steeped in how, um, 
how we organize the things that the Bible teaches about God. Um, as we're learning about who he is, who we are, how God saves, um, now we're in this kind of stretch where we're looking at the so what's, if you will. Like, if God is doing this mighty saving work, now what? What, what do we do from that? Uh, and so this morning in particular, we're going to look at uh, three chapters of this confession uh, that I've summarized as basically how to be a kingdom citizen here on earth. Like, what, what is, how does that impact us, the things that God is doing, uh, the things that he's told us in his word, how that, uh, how that we live lives in this world even though we are citizens of heaven. Uh, so there's going to be three chapters that we'll be going over. Uh, we'll put the relevant stuff on the screen. Um, but yeah, so here we go. Hopefully, I was telling somebody, I'm pretty confident we'll be shorter this week than we were last week. So it would be hard to beat. But uh, anyway, so um, chapter 23 uh, begins to talk about uh, lawful oaths and vows. Now, that's not something when you're thinking about like, okay, I'm doing a systematic theology or I'm, I'm trying to do a Bible study about the things that we believe. Normally, this is not a subject matter that comes up where we think about uh, lawful oaths and vows. But you have to remember, there's a couple of things that we're going to be talking about this morning that really a lot were birthed out of what they were struggling with culturally during that time. As you're coming out of the Reformation, as you're trying to figure out, well, what does it look like? when you have this uh, like state and how it relates to the church. There's a couple of things that we're going to be talking about there, what's appropriate to do, um, all these kinds of things. So um, you know, it'll hopefully reveal itself here as we, as we go along. So Article 1 of uh, Chapter 25 says this. It says, A lawful oath is an element of religious worship in which a person swearing in truth, righteousness, and judgment solemnly calls God to witness what is sworn and to judge the one swearing according to the truth or falsity of it. Now, that's pretty interesting that it, would think, that it would say that this is an act of religious worship, like it's part of our service. We don't ever think of it that way. So if I just say categorically, you should tell the truth, right? You should tell the truth in like all situations. Okay, like uh, we're probably tracking and then that's about it. Um, but in reality, that, that integrity of truth-telling spills over into a lot of different things that I don't think we always think about. And so, you know, when we think about elements of our public worship, are there ever things that we do as a church across fellowship that are about oaths, are this about, like, proclaiming truths? Um, you know, Chris Shaw and I were talking about it a little bit yesterday. I think there's a couple of things that would fall under that category. Number one, when we um, have children dedication, uh, when we have that time, what that is is simply uh, a proclamation of oath-taking where the parents are making this oath to be able to, uh, to the congregation, we're going to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord to teach them the truth of God's word, to proclaim the gospel and try to live that out. And the congregation is making an oath to be able to say, we will join with you in that, we will aid you in that, we will help you with that. So there are some things that we do inside of our worship service um, that are about that uh, agreement with one another, that honoring with one another. Church membership is really that way, honestly. Like that we're, we're making this commitment, this oath of how we will um, have, what kind of relationship that we're going to have with one another. So, you know, I, I, and then just from a, like stepping back up, that's like kind of in our service. But second back up to a higher level, this is the idea of how much of truth-telling should be uh, a part of what we do. So, you know, Articles 2 and 3, we're not going to read them, but um, together that's basically saying you don't be flippant in oath-taking, that when you're, um, when you're making a commitment to someone else, especially if you're going to invoke the Lord in that oath, if you're going to say, you know, I'm, I'm swearing by the Lord to whether that's in a courtroom or in a contract or all sorts of ways that we might say, I'm going to tell you in integrity and in truth, this is what I will do. Um, you know, we have all sorts of, of things that, you know, that applies to us as Christians. 
So historically, one of the things that they were wrestling with, because of some verses that we'll get to in a second, the Anabaptists during this time kind of said, no oath-taking whatsoever. We're not participating in that. So in a courtroom, nope, we're not going to do it. Um, so they refused to take legal oaths. Um, so a lot of this is in response to that, to say, we don't believe that that's what the Bible teaches. We don't believe that the Bible says to not participate when you go to a courtroom and they make you swear that you're going to take an oath and you put your hand on a Bible. And I guess I still do that. I have no idea. Um, but in that, it's fine. Like, as a Christian, you can participate in that. Now, the reality is, for us in our context, I would guess you probably have never considered whether or not you should or should not do that, right? It's just part of your culture. You just said, yeah, okay, whatever they ask me to do, I'm gonna do. And a lot of the things that we do are that way. We don't question, hmm, what does God think about this thing? What should I do? And maybe you come to the conclusion where participating is fine, and maybe you come to the conclusion where you're like, you know what, I think God is teaching something else and I shouldn't participate. But the point is, do we have a category for that? Do you have the practice of taking all these things that are in our culture, all these practices that we have, and ask, what does the Lord think about this? What does God think about it? How, how, what, what is he going to do in this, or what is he asking me to do in this situation? A couple of passages that speak to this. So Leviticus 19, 12 says, you shall not swear by my name, falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Hebrews 6.16 says, for people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So it's talking about really a, a definition of what an oath is, like the act of swearing is to appeal to a higher uh, authority, if you will. You can't swear by like, I promise. It's like, well, an oath amps it up something. Like, it's like, okay, it's not just my word, but I'm gonna swear on something greater than me. But then James 5, 12 says this, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or nor by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So, what is God's position? Does he want you to take an oath? Or does he not want you to take an oath? Like, what is the uh, preference here? What is he after? Well, what I believe James is doing in that chapter is I think he's referring to Jesus' teaching in Matthew when Jesus was essentially making the same argument, which was combating the tendency to do a couple of things. This is what the Pharisees would do. What they're doing is they're taking their oaths either not seriously that were... Um, it's so, like, if I made an oath to God... Okay, and we'll, you might call it a vow. We'll talk about vows in a second. But if I make an oath to God, all right, I'm gonna take that real seriously because that's God and I should not mess with God, right? Like, uh, uh, don't lie to God. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that we would all go, yeah, that's true. But uh, if it wasn't to God, if I'm making an oath to just another person, eh, I might take that a little less seriously. Like, I might not be as concerned um, that, you know, that that oath is, uh, you know, this is, like basically as much weight of uh, obeying on it. But that's certainly not the case. We want our integrity to be there. So, uh, and the other thing is, they basically you frivolously use alternate ways of saying God's name without the obligation of honesty. So you could say, well, I swear by heaven and earth that I will do such a thing. So it sounds kind of like godly, but I didn't really invoke the name of God. Therefore, my oath is not as like concrete. I can kind of get away with it. So this is the kind of stuff that they were doing, um, that they were trying to figure out loopholes, essentially, in oath-taking. So when Jesus is condemning this, and then James, therefore, echoing that, he's saying this reality is that we don't try to find loopholes. We don't try to say, okay, I'm gonna swear by things that sound godly, but maybe it's not the name of God. Um, that in a sense, when we enter into an oath, we take it seriously. We, no matter who it's with, our obligation is to proclaim the integrity of God, who he is by our actions. So if, if 
When, let me just tell you, when God says he will do something, he does it, right? Does he ever fail? Does he fail to come through on that? No. And so if we are his representation, it should seem to bear true that that should be our status, okay? Um, okay, moving on. Article four basically says, uh, an oath is to be expressed in plain and ordinary meaning of words without any ambiguity or mental reservation. So we're not trying to uh, trick people. We're not trying, you know, again, could you stop and say, hey, the way we do contracts in our culture might not be uh, a very straightforward uh, thing of an integrity and honesty? Yeah, uh, that probably is true in a lot of circumstances where as a Christian, I should be very straightforward and clear with what it is that uh, I'm you know, making an oath for. Psalm 24 says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. What an interesting idea that we have this nature of who God is. If I'm thinking about he who has clean hands and a pure heart and, and dwells with God, and it talks about being someone who is honest. Uh, you know, I feel like in our culture, if we just are real with ourselves, honesty is like, it's like, a, it's like it sounds good. Sure, tell the truth, whatever. But there's not, a, there's not like this kind of innate thing. I, I feel like in our culture, we've gotten really comfortable lying. I'll just say that. We've gotten really comfortable being deceitful, really comfortable fudging the truth a little bit and just kind of pushing lines and boundaries and all that kind of stuff. Uh, when in reality, what will honor God is our commitment to truth. Last article in this section, a vow must not be made to any creature but to God alone. So this is now talking about a vow. It's somewhat the same, a little bit different. Um, but vows should be made and performed with the most conscientious care and faithfulness. However, Roman Catholic monastical vows of perpetual single life, professed poverty, obedience to monastical rules are by no means steps to higher perfection. Instead, they are superstitious and sinful snares in which Christians may not entangle themselves. So you can see they're definitely taking a, something that was really important for them in context as they're coming out of the Reformation. They're trying to make the distinctions between the way the Catholic Church was operating uh, and what they believed a biblical way of doing that is. But essentially, if I had to summarize, what they're focusing on is how to avoid a mystical treatment of our lives to God. Like, if we take vows of poverty, vows of silence, vows of celibacy, vows of this, as if that commitment is going to elevate me in my relationship with God, I will be more spiritual, I'll be more blessed by God if I make these commitments. I think I've told you before, I can distinctly remember as a kid, you know, having times where I'm like, okay, God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. Like, I'm constantly bargaining with God, like, I'm gonna make this vow um, to do this, and then you're going to help me over here. Right, So it's kind of a mystical, kind of genie-like approach to if I make a promise to God, then I'm going to get what I want. And even if that thing is great, even I'm not saying that thing I want is necessarily like totally self-serving. What if I want to be like Christ? What if I want to grow in the faith? And then I think that I can do that by making these vows and promises to God. Like, hey, I'm gonna do this and you're gonna do that for me. Now, one of the applications that this article does make, interestingly, is it starts to pull marriage into this idea, and we're gonna talk about marriage here in a bit, but like the idea of this vow, and so that the application here is that the marriage vows should be taken way more seriously than they are in our society because it's not just about our vow to the other person, but our vow before God. And so even one of the passages that is used in Matthew 19, 11 really talks about whether or not somebody even might be gifted towards maybe singleness, like maybe marriage isn't for you. So before we get to the marriage chapter, um, we do wanna make sure that that is, like, I think that's a legitimate thing. So much, certainly in church life and even in culture, kind of focuses on families and that's wonderful. Rightfully so, families are important. 
But um, there is uh, like uh, uh, an idea that God would call people to be single, that there is a, a way for that. So just real quick, a good resource. Uh, Barry Danilak wrote a book called Redeeming Singleness. Um, this is a great resource. We'll, well, we're building a resource section out here. I'll make sure it's up there sometime. Uh, a great resource to think through the fact that not every life does look the same, that if God calls someone to singleness, that is a perfectly valid uh, thing in, in the life of a believer. Okay, so oaths, let's, like, like, let's be people of integrity and truth-telling. Um, one thing before I move off of it, just kind of, I thought of it. Um, that's essentially what the gospel and salvation is. It is God's oath to you that you will be saved. We've talked about how there is a right now and not yet to salvation. So there is a right now declaration of you are justified, you are declared not guilty by God. But our salvation is not complete. It is a promise that we are holding on to to the end. And so even when we tell the truth, even in our integrity of truth-telling, that is a proclamation of the gospel. It is a, a picture of who God is and how secure we are in that promise that he has made us, right? That we are secure in his promise, not our uh, vow, our obedience. Okay, chapter 24, everyone's favorite subject matter, the civil government. Like, okay, so... Um, now, uh, I think, uh, I can't remember how long ago, I, I preached a message on, like, I thought the, the church and politics, um, that may, it was probably several years ago now, um, and we don't have time to be fully exhaustive here, so we're going to really just kind of focus on the, the matters that are brought up, but I think it is important to know that there are several different approaches when it comes to exploring how a kingdom citizen relates to our earthly kingdoms you can have differences there, okay? Um, so whether it's full immersion or full retreat and everything in between, uh, there's a lot of different uh, ideas about that. So, you know, uh, we're just going to kind of focus in here, but know that there's some, some room here. But Article 1 says this. It says, God, the supreme Lord and King of the whole world, has ordained civil authorities to be under him and over the people for his own glory and the public good. For this purpose, he has armed them with the power of the sword to defend and encourage those who do good and to punish evildoers. So a very straightforward teaching. Uh, the government, like it or not, is from God. This is God's idea about how to do two things, to suppress sin and to encourage goodness. This is what the purpose of the government is. You can certainly uh, debate all day about the effectiveness of their ability to do those two things, but that is the purpose. So Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. That's huge. All authority is a representation of God's authority in our lives. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. This is God's design for our cultures, to have government um, are they ever going to be perfect? No. Um, but the purpose of them is to help suppress sin and to encourage righteousness. Article 2 talks about our engagement. So Christians may lawfully accept and carry out the duties of public office when called to do so. In performing their office, they must especially maintain justice and peace according to the wholesome laws of each kingdom or other political entity. To carry out these duties, they are authorized now under the New Testament to wage war in just and necessary situations. We'll come back to that last part in a bit. But the idea that it, we don't believe in a full retreat necessity, that Christians are to have nothing to do with the systems of this world. It is perfectly godly and good that if you feel compelled 
to go and engage in there, you can carry out the duties of public office when called to do so. Um, so whether that's uh, choosing to be like elected in something or even uh, you know drafted into a position or whatever, um, then we believe that by pure like the truth of God's word, you can participate. You can go and honor God with your choices there, try to fight for truth and justice. Doesn't mean you have to, but that it's certainly an okay thing to do. So thinking some verses to help us think through this. 2 Samuel 23, 3 and 4 says, The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. So that's God's encouragement that that can be a positive, beneficial thing, not only that glorifies God, but that benefits humanity. Psalm 82, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the weak and needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Now, I'm going to be just like real personal for a second. My natural tendency in these matters is disconnection. And part of that is just honestly, I'm a pretty cynical person. Um, like that's just the way my heart, like uh, uh, for whatever reason, that's, that's my tendency. So I'm sure you've seen that in the way I pastor. So right or wrong, I've chosen in a lot of worldly matters uh, I just don't say things. I don't address them. That's not my tendency. I, I you know, kind of disciple uh, the congregation towards having biblical wisdom and a conscience for you to evaluate that which goes on and to make a decision. Um, and so I'm not saying necessarily that's wrong, but um, that is how I see things. And it might be wrong. It might be right. Probably some occasions it's right or wrong. I don't know. But the reformers as a whole, most, most certainly did not see church that way. They were not hardwired into a separation of church and state as an outlook on society. They didn't have our culture. Maybe some of it's why I, I act the way that I do. In fact, I think probably most of the reformers would reject the idea of a separation of church and state. At a base level, I think you could at least make the argument that they believed the state desperately needed the church's influence at a bare minimum. Um, and, and that very well may be true. Certainly the church's people as an influence. Uh, now some argued actually for a church of the state, but uh, I think we can, uh, for us, confidently put that aside and say that's not really something that we're looking for. Regardless of how we land on our role here and what part Cross Fellowship Church plays, this article definitely encourages those among you who feel led to be a part of change in whatever way that is for culture. So whether that's engagement in the public sphere, um, whether that's running for office, uh, whether that's volunteering um, in different nonprofits, however you want to see the change that God desires in the world to be brought about, then you know work that out in faith community, get counsel, Pray, read God's word, and we will bless that. We think that, hey, that is great um, for individuals to be able to follow through. We think the Bible maintains that ability. Then Article 3, the last article, says, because civil authorities are established by God for the purposes stated, we should submit in the Lord to them and everything lawful that they require. We should submit not only for fear of punishment, <clears throat> but also for the sake of conscience. We ought to make requests and prayers for kings and everyone in authority so that under their rule we may live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. I mean, this is pretty much just straight pulled from, you know, Romans there. Uh, so the idea is that we submit to the governing authorities and everything that is lawful. They are not talking about the uh, state laws. They are talking about God's laws. So in all that is in submission to God, we obey. When they ask or require of things that is outside of the will of God, we are free to disobey. In fact, must disobey. Romans 13, kind of finishing that passage, therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, 
but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. First Peter 2 also has this subject matter. Uh, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Now, that's a pretty bold statement for people who are under, like, Roman authority at this time. They do not have good leaders. They have leaders who want to persecute them, and yet are given some pretty challenging commands there. And then in the idea of prayer, 1 Timothy 2, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Um, so I, to circle back around, at the very end of that article, it does talk about a rejection of Christian pacifism in terms of not being able to uh, go to war. Um, and so what I think really the, the primary point here is to show how what might be commanded to, because, you know, there's all sorts of like peaceful, turn the other cheek type of teachings. There is a difference in the Bible between how it talks about what an individual's obligation is and what the state's obligation is. That the state has uh, an ability to suppress sin and promote good. And even through the sword, it may do that. Um, and then we can certainly talk about what, what roles individuals play in that. Um, but that's the state. Okay, finally, last, last chapter is on marriage. Now, I feel like we do talk about marriage a lot. Just as a, as a church, it's one of the best things about marriage is that it's such a beautiful picture of the gospel. Uh, we spend a lot of time in Ephesians 5 talking about how, um, you know, that God has instituted this thing where it's a picture of Christ and his church. And so the love and commitment that you have there should be a very gospel-telling thing. But this... Uh, you know, this particular chapter when it's talking about marriage is really kind of laying out just very ground rules. It doesn't really speak extremely spiritually. Um, it's, it's just talking about the like basics of what they believe marriage is kind of in culture, really. Uh, so article one, marriage is to be between one man and one woman. A man must not have more than one wife nor a woman more than one husband at the same time. Very clear, straightforward um, way of kind of dealing with some of the things that they were talking about. Now, I will say, uh, if you ever had an engagement with somebody who is not a believer, atheist, and they love to try to pull things from the Bible to have arguments about, uh, a lot of time they will bring up the idea that there is polygamy in the Bible. So particularly in the Old Testament, as you're wrestling with these things where you've got these kings of Israel who have multiple wives. Well, what's up with that, church? Um, why would God say not to have multiple wives and then these people have multiple wives? Well, two things that I would say about that. Number one, the Bible never condones it. It just says it happened. So we have to be very careful in that when you're reading the Bible and it's like story time, this is a narrative, that we don't ever want to take what is happening there as instruction always about what we should do. It is just simply saying, this is what happened, okay? So that's number one. Number two, those stories, when you kind of flesh out that polygamy, never works out well. It's not like, um, it's like, oh, and they live happily ever after. Uh, no, <laughs> that is not what happens in those situations. It brings about downfall. It never works out well for the person. Uh, so, but that's an important, I thought it would be important to talk about, because I'm sure if you ever have conversations with people who are trying to kind of argue against the Bible, that would come up. Article number two says that marriage was ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife, for the increase of humanity with legitimate offspring, and the, for the prevention of immorality. Now, I want to be careful here. Um, let me make sure I'm not going to take Yeah, okay, well, I'll do it here. 
Uh, I believe that sometimes we over-romanticize marriage. Now, I know that sounds bad and sounds like an unchristian thing to say, but if you're just trying to get to the heart of what the Bible's teaching is about marriage, is that it's okay to talk about sometimes the functions of marriage. What is it doing that God has told you its purposes are? So we talked about it is a spiritual thing, um, that it is showing us and displaying the glory of the majesty of the gospel that is now lived out in two people who choose to be committed to one another. And it's not really based on how they feel about it. So if I, in Article 2, so it's the mutual help of husband and wife, so it is a mutually beneficial, wonderful relationship, that is the increase of humanity with legitimate offspring, so procreation, and then for the prevention of immorality. So, you know, when the Bible talks about for those who just can't help themselves, instead of living in sexual immorality, to enter into the covenant of marriage. Now, none of those things are predicated on how you feel about the other person. Uh, so, I, I, again, am I against uh, lovey-dovey, like, you know, warm fuzzies. When Of course not. That is wonderful. That, I pray for that byproduct. And if it's not in your marriage, then we certainly want to be pursuing how you can compassionately love one another. But it is not the culmination of the relationship. And in fact, I would say our culture almost says it's the only aspect of relationship. How I feel about a person at any given point in time should be how I make a decision. Yet the Bible doesn't have really space for that. Okay, we could go on, but I'm not going to. All right, so Article 3 says, everyone who is able to give rational consent may marry. Yet Christians are to marry in the Lord. Therefore, those who profess the true religion should not marry unbelievers or idolaters, nor should the godly be unequally yoked by marrying those who lead evil lives or hold to damnable heresy. So, um, it's important for us to know, so yes, you can marry. Remember, when we talked about the vows, I take a vow of celibacy as if that were like the ultimate uh, in, you know, I'm, I'm super spiritual. No, the Bible says, yeah, get married. Marriage is great. Marriage is great for those who are leading the church. Married, marriage is great for those in the church. Yes, marry. But an important principle throughout the whole Bible is be careful in your marriage not to Two, if at any way possible, blend it between unbelief and belief. This is the thing that was happening that brought about the corruption of the nation of Israel over and over and over and over again. God would warn them. They would do it anyway. They would become disobedient to God, and therefore they would suffer the consequences of that decision. So it's important um, for that relationship. Now, in this article, the confession uses 1 Timothy 4 here about marriage not being forgive, uh, forbidden. Um, but I think it's a good reminder. Last week, we talked about Christian liberty. So I'm going to expand it a little bit and, uh, and read uh, verses 1 through 3 of 1 Timothy 4. It says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars, whose consciences are, being, are, are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So like I told you, there is an instance to where singleness might be a gifting that God is giving you, a calling in your life to, to live that way. And that, that is perfectly a uh, viable thing that I believe that God does in people's lives. But we don't say, hey, if you are single, it's a better thing in terms of your stacking up relationship with God. So if a priest vows celibacy and is never going to marry, it doesn't make them a better priest than some, a priest who is married, right? That's not how that works. There, there's no um, like a trick, no mystical thing there. It's kind of what we were talking about earlier. Um, same thing with like abstinence from foods, like having a certain diet, all these things that we have been set free from. We have Christian liberty in them. 
I thought it was a good reminder. And then Article 4 is simply against uh, incestuous marriages, and so I, I didn't figure we need to spend a lot of time there. Uh, it's generally in a culturally agreed upon position. Um, if you doubt that, uh, we can certainly have a conversation, so please uh, see us afterwards. Um, so yeah, so here we are, these, these different aspects of what it means to live life in this world in a way that displays that, yes, we can be for the good of this world, we can live for the benefit of this world, but we are not citizens of this world. And so the way in which I go about oath-taking, the way in which I go about um, really any of these things, even our marriages, are to display the glory of God and to show a different way to live, a different way to follow after him. And so my prayer for us as a church is that we will be committed to even things like how we relate to the government, how we, uh, what kind of integrity we have in our, our oaths, our vows, um, you know, in all of these things, and certainly in our marriages, that we are committed above all things to how God gets glory. And then uh, some of the ramifications of that is how then uh, the, the culture is blessed in those things. So, you know, it's uh, just kind of as we're about to pray and head into communion time, um, it's stuff like this where often you're like, well, that doesn't feel very spiritual, right? So we were talking about like these like oath-taking and government and, you know, marriages, and you're like, but what about, you know, my, my discipleship? This is discipleship. This is part of it. And so I hope that, you know, all these different areas in your life, let me just as a quick last side note, aren't confined to maybe what's written in the confession and or maybe other systematic theology books, but I would challenge you to think through, well, what does God think about blank? In my life, I take so much for granted. I assume so much in how I'm supposed to live. I just kind of go with the culture. I haven't really ever vetted it and asked myself what would be appropriate in this situation. Start doing that. Um, I would encourage you to do that. Again, not under the weight of guilt. We have been set free um, in Christ but in our desire to honor and glorify him with our lives, may we pursue holiness in all matters. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, I thank you so much for this, the privilege of being gathered here together with our um, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Lord, as we've kind of dug into your word a little bit to, to see what you have called us to believe in different situations, how you've called us to act, uh, God, I pray that you will help us to be faithful to that, faithful to honor you. And God, above all things, as we're heading into a particular time of remembrance, Lord, we pray that we will see the gospel in all of these situations. God, help us to see the gospel as truth-telling, this promise, this oath that you have made us that we can hold fast to. And so when I tell the truth, when I keep a promise, when I keep an oath, it is a taste of eternity when you will fulfill your oath to us, your vow to us. God, when we think about governing authorities, Lord, may the gospel reign supreme there as we know and bend the knee to the ultimate authority, that we trust what you have said in our lives, that your goal is, is to bring about your glory and salvation through judgment. And that authority is a part of that. So even when we submit to authorities, it is a picture of how we submit to you. We bow the knee to King Jesus. And certainly as we think about our marriages, God, I pray that we will see the glorious picture of Christ and the church and your love and your commitment to us, that you make a vow that cannot be broken and that's the type of vow we make to one another. And certainly as we think through just like the, the travesty of divorce, God, Lord, I pray that we also see that in the warning sign of idolatry, that it reminds us of our need to be committed to you, to not lift our face to another, but to worship you and you alone. Lord, as we spend time communing with one another and with Christ in remembrance of his sacrifice. 
I pray that you will bless us. We ask these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. We are going to head into a time of communion. Uh, If you happen to be new here, we celebrate each week. At Cross Fellowship, we invite those who have repented of their sins and believed in Jesus as their Savior to participate with us. Um, Our ushers are going to be passing out uh, plates with two cups stacked together. Take them both, hold on to it, and we will partake together. So we also believe that communion is for those who are not in unrepentant sin. Paul gives us a warning in 1 Corinthians 11 that says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So across fellowship, we try to fulfill this uh, idea in two different ways. Uh, Number one, to reflect on what the Lord's Supper is, and then to spend time in repentant prayer. So what is the Lord's Supper? That Christ commanded all Christians to eat bread and to drink from the cup in thankful remembrance of him and his death. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of the presence of God in our midst, bringing us into communion with God and with one another, feeding and nourishing our souls. It also anticipates the day when we will eat and drink with Christ in his Father's kingdom. So we're going to take a moment to go before the Lord, asking him to examine our hearts and for us to confess the sin that has so easily entangled us. We'll spend uh, some quiet time in prayer, t- and then we'll, uh, we'll continue together. So let's pray. Father God, we ask that you will listen to the cries of your people, forgive us of our sins, enlighten us to sins that we're unaware of, and Lord, we thank you and praise you that you have told us, you have promised us, you have made an oath to us that when we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it is in that promise that we gather here to participate in communion. We pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So first we partake of the bread, which represents the body of Christ. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And second, we partake of the cup, which represents the blood of Christ. Paul continues, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us stand and sing praises to our King Jesus. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But holy trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built. My 
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but only trust in Jesus' name. In Christ alone, Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems, when darkness seems to hide His face. I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds, my anchor holds within the well. My anchor holds, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, in Christ alone. in his righteousness alone and faultless stand before the throne and faultless stand before the throne Amen and Christ alone cornerstone we the Savior's love Though the nations rage, though the nations rage, kingdoms arise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. So I wish. This truth remains that my God is the ancient of days. None above him, none above him, none before him, all of time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and never stay.
Jesus, you are king and you reign above all. And when kings and kingdoms fall, you remain. And so we worship you as king and as ruler. And Father, may we live as subjects in your kingdom, glorifying you. God, and may all that we do, may all that we say, may all that we, in the way that we interact with people, Father, may it point completely and only to you. And so, Father, in the way that we conduct ourselves, in the way that we live as citizens, Father, in the way that we worship, in the way that we live our lives in good times and in times of struggle, in the way that we navigate through mourning and hardship, in the way that we celebrate, Lord God, in the way that we live on the mountaintop, Father, may all of these things point to you and glorify you as king. And you reign, Lord God, and you deserve honor and glory. And you do good things. And you are good, and so we worship you. And we thank you for who you are and for what you have done. And it's you and you alone that we praise and that we worship. It's in your great name, Jesus. We pray. Let's continue to worship this morning. Let's celebrate God who does great things. Come, let us worship. Oh, come, let us worship our King. Come.
You've been faithful. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. Oh, you have done great things. And I know you'll do it again. And I know you will do it again. For your promise yes and amen. Oh, you will do great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven. Yeah, we hope to see you back next week.